We do come before you again and open our spirits to you. And Lord, we confess that your ways are not our ways. Your thoughts, the things that you think are so different than the things we think about the beauty of human life in the gospel. We ask that your ways and your thoughts, which are so vastly superior to ours, they would be communicated to us by the Holy Spirit. We ask you to do that. Holy Spirit, take us on that treasure hunt up that mountain of God into the beauty and the fascination of Christ Jesus. We thank you. Amen and amen. Chapter, I mean, uh, session 12, the ravished heart of the heavenly bridegroom. This is really one of the uh, premier sections of the book. I know I've said that like 12 times already, but this one really is. Okay, verse 9. The Lord speaking to the bride, who incidentally has just ascended, verse 6, to go her way to the mountain of Myrrh. We really skipped uh, in the last session, verse 8, because the mountain does have lions and lepers. It is perilous in the flesh. Paul the Apostle understood what it meant to, to press in to that place that stirred up the powers of darkness against him. So much so that the demons said, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? Paul pressed into a place in the Lord that threatened different uh, uh, parts of Satan's kingdom. And the lions and lepers are there to, to, to roar and to cause trouble. But we are going with the Lord to the top of the mountains, it says in verse 8. And so in verse 9, he speaks to her now again. He's told her what she looks like in verse 1 to 5. Now he's going to tell her what he feels like when he looks at her. He told her what she looked like to him. Now he's going to say, this is what I feel when I look at you. And this passage seems so good to be true that we lapse right into unbelief. I mean, seriously. This is the Word of God as much as the book of Romans is. This is the very heart of God, the Holy Spirit, calling us into communion with Christ Jesus. He says, the Lord says, you have ravished my heart, my sister, my my bride, or my spouse. Most of the uh, uh, versions say spouse, I, I, I mean bride. You have ravished my heart with one look of your eyes, with one link of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better than wine is your love. And the scent of your perfumes are better than all the spices. Your lips. Oh, my bride, drip as honeycomb. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. A a garden enclosed. It's my sister, my bride. A spring shut up, a a fountain sealed. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, fragrant henas with spikenard, spikenard, etc., etc., etc. A fountain of gardens, a well of living water, streams. Awake, O north winds. Come, O south winds. Blow upon my garden. Why? That its spices may flow out. And that's the key point. She says, I want his fragrance to fill my life. I want my fragrances to flow out of my communion, my communion with Him. Let my beloved, oh Jesus, come to His garden and eat its pleasant fruits. Then Jesus answers, I have come my, to my garden, my sister, my bride. I've gathered my myrrh, my spice. I've eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I've drunk my wine and my milk. Eat, oh friends, drink, yes, drink deeply, oh beloved ones. Overview of This passage, Jesus is romancing his bride. The Spirit of God is, is, when he brings the, our hearts into a place of perceiving by the Holy Spirit or into the place of revelation, he sweeps us off our feet. It's the romance of the gospel. I talked about the seven longings in our heart that I associate with uh, the bridal paradigm of the kingdom, the, the kingdom. The longing to be enjoyed. To be delighted in. The longing to be fascinated. The longing to be adorned. 
The longing for intimacy, the longing for greatness, the longing to be wholehearted, and the longing for relevance, or that longing for the heroic to make a significant difference. Those seven longings that are related to us entering into the pleasures of the gospel. He answers those, and that's what I mean by romance is his bride. He touches those longings that are a reflection of his own heart that he imparted into us that I, we talked about some, a few sessions back. He's romancing his bride right now. He's letting her see what he sees when he looks at her. She feels the truth of it. And when we feel the truth of this, we become lovesick. The three verses I don't have written here that describe uh, Paul the Apostle as lovesick. Romans 8.18, Paul says in Romans 8.18, he says, the sufferings of this age, they can't be compared to what's coming. He says, I've seen something. And he goes, don't, don't even compare whatever prison sentence they can give me. That's a lovesick man speaking. 2 Corinthians 4.17, he says same, the same things after, after multiple whippings and beatings. He says, the momentary light afflictions uh, he says, they're nothing to the incomparable weight of eternal glory that I've already touched. He goes, I don't care about beatings. That's a lovesick man. He says it again in Philippians 3.8. He says, I've suffered the loss of everything. He says, and what do I think about giving up everything? It's rubbish because of the excellency of the beauty of Christ Jesus. That's a lovesick man. That's a romanced man in the Holy Spirit. He looks at difficulty in this age and says, don't ever put it into the, 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 the balance of what I'm receiving from the Holy Spirit and where I know I'm going. That's what I mean by romance in the gospel. Our hearts are lovesick. That's where the Lord's, I mean, that's, that's where we want to go. Introducing the ravished heart of God. Jesus looks in the editor and says, you've ravished my heart. You've ravished my heart. He repeats it. The ravished heart of God romances her. It's how he feels about her. Again, the first five verses is what she looked like. This is how he feels when he looks at her. This is absolutely fantastic that this is how God looks at us. Beloved, have you ever thought about the implications of a lovesick God gazing in your eyes, lovesick over you? He has all authority, all power, dwells in eternity, and he wants only you. How does that define your life? That changes everything. Absolutely everything changes in the revelation of a ravished God. The ravished heart of God, a lovesick God. This revelation equips her for the hundredfold obedience that she's committed to in verse 6. And she's going to walk it out in chapter 5. Chapter 5 is, a, is a, one of the, wow, chapter 5. Look at that next week. He's equipping her to walk it out. In chapter 5, this is very significant that the revelation of chapter 4 is essential for the endurance and the steadfastness of chapter 5. And the end time church is going to walk in the tensions of chapter 5. And I believe there's no way we can do it without the revelation of the bridal paradigm we see in the first four chapters of the Song of Solomon. Those seven longings being answered and touched in our spirit. If I had to pick one phrase to title this entire book, The Song of Subs, I would choose this phrase, The Ravished Heart of God. This one verse summarizes really the whole book. It's what God feels like when he looks at you, Eric. When he looks at you, he's ravished. Isn't that something? This is the truth. He's ravished when he looks at you. Yeah, yeah. No, no, don't. Yeah, yeah. This is the truth. God became a human he was crushed by the wrath of God because of you. He wants you so bad. The burning heart of the uncreated God moved him to lay aside the form of God, to take upon the form of man, to be crushed by the wrath of God, to marry you forever. That's what this thing is about. As this touches my spirit a little bit, I go, what am I bothered about? I've already won everything that matters. Beloved, I, we've already won. Your mailing list may increase or decrease in your ministry. You've already won big time regardless what happens in those arenas. You're all, you've already won. We have to walk out certain things and 
But we walk out as, as more than conquerors because we have exceedingly conquered the day we were born again, whether we ever enter into the feeling of it in this age. We are more than conquerors because it's already finished in the heart of God. Romans 8. A working definition of the ravished heart of God. Ravished means to overcome with emotions of joy or delight. Unusually attractive, unusually pleasing, unusually striking. Synonyms for ravish, delight, enchant, captivate, attract, enthrall, etc., etc. A summary of the Hebrew definition and its English equivalent. God is overwhelmed with emotion of delight because of one who is unusually beautiful, striking or attractive to his heart. That is the gospel and that is the identity of your life. While you are maturing, not only when you go to heaven. I tell you, when, a little bit of that will go a long way in changing our emotional chemistry. Jesus' heart is filled with extravagant passions, gladness, delight. It's fantastic that our God is filled with emotion. Think about what it would be the other way. Well, that's how most people imagine God. It's not good news what they imagine. Many believers have a paradigm of a God so utterly different than the God of Scripture. He's filled with emotion. That's why we are. The reason we have gladness is because He's a glad God. God describes his own heart as overcome with delight with people that he finds unusually attractive. He feels these emotions even towards immature believers. People find this difficulty, find difficulty grasping this truth. But I believe the Holy Spirit will reveal this divine romance. By the way, it, it takes supernatural revelation to see this. People say to me uh, regularly, I want to see it, I want to see it. I say, well then, Put yourself in the position of putting these truths in your heart because God releases it to the hungry who feed on these truths. There's no mystery on how to grow in this. People are a little disappointed as the different ones I talk to because they want a secret. They want a mystery. I go, feed you. if you're hungry for this reality, feed your heart with it. And just let some months and years go by. If you get impatient, throw a little fasting in. That always speeds up the process. Really, it enlarges your capacity to receive. It tenderizes your heart. There's no mystery. The most simple, uneducated person on the earth can enter into this. There's no trick. There's no hidden mystery. Feed yourself on these truths if you're hungry. And in time, the Spirit of God will little by little begin to awaken these truths in our hearts. And, and the key that I've said week after week, we take these little fragments, these little truths, we turn them into prayer in our personal life, and that's the context in which the Holy Spirit ignites them. We take little phrases, uh, just, just a, um, uh, uh, either a, an actual phrase or the meaning of a phrase, and we speak it back to God, we meditate on it, we search it out, we study it, we speak it over with our friends, we pray it as we're driving, coming and going, and in that context, the Spirit of God drops a match on it, and the fire begins. What a lot of folks are just imagining, they'll go to a course, say, okay, that's what I want, go on business as usual, squandering all their time and their energy, feeding their minds on the things of the flesh, entrenching themselves in an unrenewed mind, and say, it's so difficult entering into this thing. You can't fill your mind with garbage and end up tenderized. It doesn't work that way. The Spirit of God says, if you're hungry, put yourself in the way of the fire. Put your cold heart in front of the bonfire of God and it will ignite you in time. And if you get impatient, throw a little fasting in. It speeds it up. Lock into a 10-year plan. Don't conclude it doesn't work till you've done it 10 years. Don't do the three-month plan because you've taken longer than three months to renew your mind in unrighteousness. You're not going to unrenew your mind in three months. Give it a 10-year commitment and say, in 10 years, if no changes, I'm out of this thing. The Lord says, good, I'll take you on that one. You seek me diligently for 10 years and uh, you won't be a little bit, just a little. The hill of frankincense gives us power to ascend the mountain of myrrh. Just a little bit of pressing and we take one step. He really does take 10. I challenge you just to take one step. Just go a little bit for about 10 years. Say, 10 years? No, no, 10, you're going to do it anyway. Something for 10 years. You might as well do the right thing. I mean, you've already got a couple 10-year things behind you already. It really works that way. Okay. 
Throw away that three-month plan. That thing is just craziness. That's, there's nothing in the Word of God that says three months, everything's different. I don't even, that, I don't relate to that at all. First leg of the race is 10 years. Okay. <clears throat> I'm, I'm really serious. It's just to set yourself on that. And don't, don't get cranky about it until you've done it for a little while. I, I know it's, it's a little humorous, but I, I'm deadly serious. I'm really serious about this. <clears throat> Paul encouraged the church to break strongholds of the mind. A stronghold in the mind is a collection of thoughts that are in agreement with the devil and not in agreement with God. Wrong ideas that exalt themselves against the truth of who God is and who we are to God. We destroy strongholds by agreeing with God, by feeding our spirit on these truths. False ideas about the knowledge of God, false ideas about the knowledge of God leads you to false ideas about what you look like to God, and that damages our intimacy with God. False ideas about what God's heart is like leads us to false ideas as to what we look like to God. A mean God looks at us in a mean way, and then we define our lives very differently. This damages our intimacy with the Lord. We have to see a glad God crowned on his wedding day, looking into your eyes ravished while you're maturing and calling forth the budding issues of your life that cause beauty to break forth and gladness in your life as these virtues grow. We looked at this uh, in session six, but I'm just going to say one phrase of it again because we did it a bit lengthy in session six. Jesus says, I feel about you the way the Father feels about me. That's in essence what that says. That God, the second person, feels about you like God, the first person, feels about him. Beloved, that is staggering. Because he spoke that. He looked them into the eyes and told them, the way my Father feels about me is how I feel about you. The implications are vast. I don't want to go through that again, but you can just look at those notes and review session six on that. God's ravished heart is central to the end time church. The glory of God's kingdom is the person of Christ Jesus. Oh, beloved, the glory of the kingdom is the branch of the Lord unveiled in his beauty to our spirits. The knowledge of his emotional makeup is vital to a strong foundation in grace. We will never be strong in the grace of God. Here's what I mean by strong in the grace of God. Where the accusations of the devil don't take root in us. Someone that's strong in the grace of God is someone that sees their weak flesh and with confidence runs into the arms of Jesus saying, You love me, I'm beautiful, you love me. That's someone strong in the grace of God. Someone weak in the grace of God discovers their weak flesh writes themselves off as a hopeless hypocrite, conclude God, if he catches them, he'll kill them, turns around and runs from God with a hundred excuses and just lives a life of sin. Someone strong in the grace of God says, God, I've just discovered a new part of my weak flesh. And the Lord says, I know a whole lot more than you know. God, you love me. I'm your favorite. I'm beautiful to you. I love you. You love me. I am yours. He goes, you're understanding a little bit of the introduction to the grace of God. Beloved, that I am, that is serious as I can be. That is the introduction to the grace of God. The ravished heart of God. The glory of the gospel flourishes in the understanding of the extravagant passions of the personality of God. It's not enough to know what he's done on the cross. Oh, that's glorious. I'm not demeaning that. Oh, the, the glorious finished work of the cross. You cannot, you cannot speak of anything greater than that. But I'm not satisfied just knowing what he did. I want to know why he did it. I do want to know what he did, but I got one more question. What motivated you to do it? He says, my heart burns with desire. I'm the burning heart of the uncreated God. Before Genesis 1, he burned with desires for love with the human race that he had not yet even created. He burned with desire. When you tap into that, you understand what he did far better when you understand why he did it. And we don't have to bring our arguments. And then we don't have to do our excuses. And then we don't have to blame anybody else. We can just come with no argument. I am dark, but I am lovely. I am weak, 
But I am stunning to you, O God. I love it. I love that you love me, and I love loving you. That is the context of which we look at the things of this world and say we consider them rubbish compared to the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, Philippians 3.8. The Christian paradigm of God, a God with feelings, with deep feelings. The New Testament paradigm of God as a loving father was a new idea in religious history in the, in the early church began to, a new idea of God as a loving father was a new idea, I mean, although it's in the Old Testament, it was never something that the Old Testament community of believers established in a way that, that was a common accepted paradigm of God. It was, it was technically there, but it had never ever taken root. I first ran into this idea when I was reading a commentary by William Barclay on the idea of, a, uh, he was discussing the the growing view of God in, in the religious history. And it was a fascinating couple of uh, paragraphs, and that began to trigger my heart and my thinking some years ago. And if you can find that commentary, I'm not even sure exactly where it was. I just remember I read it and went, yes, I like this. To the Jewish tradition, the primary idea of God emphasized the fact that God was holy in the sense he was separated from sin, and he was holy in the sense he was different from everything that existed. So the scribe in the Old Testament, skip a few sentences here, in no sense thought of a holy God as sharing human experience. They actually thought of God as incapable of sharing it simply because he was God, because he is holy. How could he share human experience? He's totally other than. The Greek philosophers come along. The Jewish uh, tradition was well established before Greek philosophers ever emerged on the world scene. Had an, had an even more erroneous view of God. Though God, uh, though the Hebrew, I will say, it was, ho it was accurate, but very inadequate. God is far more than one separated from wrong things. There's, that's, that's an inadequate description of his personality. Though certainly it's accurate, but not complete in any way. I'd rather say it that way. The Greek philosophers saw God as one who was emotionally distant from all others. The most prominent Greek thinker, thinkers were called the Stoics. We... We talk about the Stoics, you know, somebody with no emotions. They, you're, like, you're very Stoic today, somebody might say. They saw the primary attribute of God as apathia, by which they meant, this was the Greek philosophy, God was his, God's essential inability to feel. He was apathetic. That's where we get the word apathetic. They thought the main attribute of God was his inability to feel, and here's why. I'll just, I'll just sum it up to you instead of read it to you. They said if God can feel then God is vulnerable. If he can feel, he might get hurt. And if he can get hurt for a moment, he can be controlled. That means the one that he feels towards is for a moment greater than him. So it's impossible for God to feel. That was their logic. They ended up with a God with no feelings because a God with feelings might get wounded. And for that moment of time, he would be lesser than the one he felt for. So the Greek philosophers came and said, there can't be any God. <laughs> Then the Epicureans came along. They had a little different. It was another Greek school. They said, well, we disagree with the fact that God can't feel. What is more accurate is that God lives in, their, in the intermediate world, in that space between the worlds. And it's not that he can't feel. It's just the gods are unaware of what's going on in the earth. They're in such bliss and enjoyment, but they're totally detached. They can feel, but they're detached from human affairs. And that was the context of which the apostles came into the Roman Empire with those views of God, that paradigm of God. The Jews had a paradigm of a holy God driven by religious rules. The Stoics had the paradigm of a feelingless God who, if he felt he could be controlled, the Epicureans believed in a detached God. And to that context, the early apostles came with the revelation of the gospel, a God that feels. A God that longs. And we put the New Testament revelation with key Old Testament verses, and we have the complete picture that God desired. This was an incredible idea of a God that deliberately, listen, deliberately underwent every human experience, deliberately subjected himself to pain and weakness, a totally different view of God. It's inconceivable to the religious mindset. That a holy God could wrap himself in the garments of humanity and then be crushed by the wrath of God. Inconceivable. 
the Greeks, the Stoics, the Epicureans, the, the Jewish tradition, inconceivable that what Paul the Apostle preached could be true. It's unthinkable because it violated every known paradigm of that day. I tell you, God's thoughts and ways are so much higher than man. It's never entered into the mind of a man what God has planned and what God feels towards his creation. It's almost possible for us to realize the radical ideas the apostles brought. It was dramatic. The implications are vast. Century after century, the human race has been confronted and deceived by the idea of an untouchable God. Then we discover the one who went through everything we go through. We, in, we worship one that endured everything humans endure. Oh, beloved, this is fantastic. The implications, two significant implications. A God that feels mercy and a God with the quality of sympathetic understanding. That's the implications of Jesus Christ. Totally different God to the, to the Jews, to the Stoics, or the Epicureans, or any of the mindsets of the day. He feels tender mercy, and he has sympathetic understanding of human struggle. Some have a personality with less volatile emotions, while others have strong desires and fiery passions that bring difficult struggles. Some people don't have the same pressures and sinful tendencies that others deep, struggle with in a deep way. A person who has lived a more restricted or a modest life, has a less passionate nature, finds it almost impossible to comprehend why the other guy struggles so much. They're subtly disgusted, and they eventually condemn those they can't understand. But our God knows everything about you and understands with, with sympathy. He went through everything. He is so different than the other kind of person judging you. Well, the question of the ages is, why did he do it? Why did he do it? It says right here, you have ravished my heart. The burning heart of the uncreated God, ravished with feelings. The romantic of all the ages is the creator in Genesis 1. The reason he did it is that he longed to experience, to share love with his creation. He's the God of burning love. That's why he did it. He's the God with a ravished heart. That's the answer of all the ages. Why did he do Genesis 1? Why did he bother? Because his heart burned. That's why. His heart's been burning from eternity past because his nature can't change. Romance of the gospel. The lovesick God. The, the paradox I was mentioning Sunday of lovesickness is that we're t a lovesick person is totally satisfied, but on the sa at the very same time, thirsting and longing for more. I mean, the lovesick person says, I can't take any more, but don't leave. Uh, well, what do you want? Do you want me to stay or do you want me to leave? I am so satisfied I'm going to die, but don't leave. I want more, but I'm dying, but don't give me more, but give. There's thirst and there's satisfaction together. And the only place I've ever seen thirst unquenchable thirst and total satisfaction bound together is in the paradox of love sickness and that's in the heart of God. Jesus said in the upper room in John 4, 20, I mean John 17, 24, I don't have this written down here, he's praying his last prayer to the Father, his Father, I desire that they be with me. Oh, what a sentence. I desire. He didn't say, Father, I desire they be with me. He goes, Father, I desire my heart's burning, Abba. I want them with me as he prepared to go to the cross. I want something, Abba. I desire. And when he went to the cross and said, I thirst, speaking of his natural thirst, I believe it was reflecting his heart who longed and thirsted that the human race would come to him. He says, I thirst. And I believe that there was more going on than just natural thirst on the cross. This totally satisfied God, yet thirsting for companionship with the human race in the gospel. Just the paradox of love sickness torments us, as, torments us with the glory of God. I'm talking about in a positive sense. It's what God wants to bring us into this thing. Jesus reveals how deeply she moves him and how lovely she is to him. 
holy emotions have laid hold of the very heart of God. He declares himself as ravished. Beloved, I challenge you to spend the rest of your life grappling with the reality of a ravished God when he looks at you, longing with desire for you now, not just later, not just the apostles, not just the famous Men and women of God, you right now, ravished, kindling, with bur- his heart kindled with burning fire, looking at you now, feeling deeply. And that giving you the interpretation for why you feel deeply. Two key significant titles, my sister, my bride. The bride speaks of the affectionate partnership. That's that theme throughout the whole song, I'm not going to develop that. He longs for partnership. He doesn't just long for subjects. He wants a partner that he shares love with. He doesn't just want servants to say, yes, sir. He wants one to be intimate with. He wants a bride. Why does God want a bride? That's the glory of his heart, isn't that? It's it's a mystery to me why he wants a bride. He's so happy in himself in the fellowship of the Trinity. And why he wants us as his bride, I don't understand. But I'll take it and I'll run with it and I'll live in it. He wants a bride. That's good enough for me. And he wants me as his bride. That's even better. I don't understand why you want a bride. You're so happy without one. He goes, I'm satisfied, but I'm thirsty. You'll you'll understand it when you're in the face-to-face of that vast ocean of the love of God. When you're standing on that sea of glass, consumed in flaming fire in Revelation 15, you will understand more why I'm satisfied and I'm thirsty at the same time. I can't wait Well, if you're impatient, fast a little bit and you'll learn more about it. There you go. Okay. My sister, this is not a a small thing. The reality of the sister is as significant as the bride. The sister speaks of Jesus' human nature. He calls us his sister means we're in the same family. He could not and he did not call us my sister before the incarnation. When he said my sister, he's talking about something entirely different than what he could declare before he became a man. He was not our brother till he took upon the form of a man. Look at the passage in there, uh, there in Hebrews 2. He's not ashamed to call them brethren, to call them family members. He's not ashamed. We look at that and go, not ashamed. We, we think about that and we go, what an interesting statement to proclaim. It's almost though the issue was brought up by somebody somewhere around the throne of God. I imagine the angels saying something like, Are you sure you want to endorse them? And Jesus says, I'm not ashamed to marry them. It's not just that I want to endorse them. I'm not ashamed of them. I want to marry them. I could just imagine in my own human sense of the dialogue, the angels going, have you seen what they do to you? I'm not ashamed to call them my own stock of my own line. No, I'm not ashamed staggering reality. He's not ashamed in the court of God to look at you before all of created order and say, that one is totally mine. I not only endorse her, I will marry her forever. He's not ashamed to call you part of the family. Fant- I just I want to find out what was behind that st- sentence. Somebody brought up something to make that sentence come forth. I'll never know in this age. Jesus endured the incredible humiliation to participate, to partake of human nature. This was necessary that he might become like his brethren. For us to be a sister, he must impart to us a new nature that results in an exaltation for the redeemed. Such exaltation. We ascend and he does send so far for us to meet together as one family. He had to come so low and he had to lift us so high for us to be in the same family. Oh, it's fantastic, but it's already a fact. It is finished. And when he became our brother, it gave him the indescribable quality of aiding us with sympathetic understanding. He he feels with sympathy our plight. That's what it says in the verses under that. He looks at her and he says that he honors every glance of devotion. He says, with one look of your eyes. The New American Standard Bible says, with one glance... You ravish me with one glance. He counts every movement of our heart towards him. 
We struggle to understand this because we don't count the movements of other people's hearts towards us. When people move in their heart towards us in sincerity, but they stumble, we criticize them and reject them, but he's totally different. Every movement of our heart, even before we've walked it out, he looks at it and he says, it moves me when your heart moves towards me. We say, why? This drives me crazy. Why does this move you? Because I'm a God who lives in the vast, mysterious ocean of divine love that you can't understand. But I'm the one that governs the entire universe under my Father. Oh, I'm so glad He is who He is, aren't you? This thing is, the gospel is good, yes? It is good. I hear people say, I don't get mad at them, because I understand. They go, I don't know if it's worth it. I go, what do, what do you mean? Well, there's only two options. The, heart, the embrace of the lovesick God are destroyed by the devil. There's not a third option. It's not worth the embrace of the lovesick God. Do you know what the other option is? Do you think the devil's going to just like have sympathy and go on vacation for a while while you're chilling out in the world? He will devour you. You put a bullseye on your chest and you say, come here, devil. I give you full permission because it's not worth it anymore, the struggle. It's like going on the front lines with no weapons whatsoever. I look at people and I understand what they mean. That's how the spirit of oppression works. It's very deceptive and it blinds us, but it's like, no, no. The lovesick God wants you now and the way he looks at you is so different than you imagine. It's the only thing that life is worth. It's exactly opposite. And we don't rebuke them. We woo them. We romance them because that's how the bride goes to the mountain is by the love of God, the bridal paradigm, not by rebukes, not by hanging her over hell on a rotten stick. That's not how somebody is going to walk in the depths of obedience to God. Threatenings and warnings is what God does to the rebellious and usually for judicial reasons. Threatenings and warnings rarely awaken somebody in any substantial long-term way. Maybe it does in an initial way until we can make sense of the truth of God. I've never seen anybody make significant long-term change in the paradigm of warnings and threatenings. Again, that's warnings and threatenings mostly in the Bible are spoken to the rebellious and usually in a judicial way versus a redemptive way. And they are used of God to awaken us on the front end, but they never produce, in my opinion, they don't usually produce, I, the Lord can do what he wants, they don't usually produce long-term, deep abandonment to God. But the, the, the bridal paradigm, the beauty of God, the beauty of, of what we look like in his ravaged heart, that's what makes us run to the mountaintops. Not the fear of missing out, because our hearts are blinded and we just imagine, well, everybody else is missing out, it can't be that bad. And our, and our deceitful hearts just kind of calm us in a false way. But I tell you, the fact that you're beautiful and he wants to fascinate you and he wants to adorn you and he wants to assure you of his enjoyment, go, well, hey, that's a little different. I, I need those. Those longings are in me. And God says, I know, I put them in you. I put them in you to answer you. Every link of your necklace, again, the neck speaks of the will. Each specific decision to obey Every link, each individual response of obedience, every link moves the heart of God. Obedience in small things moves Him. God would not overlook one act of obedience. I love this. God, for God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown towards His name. God would charge himself with injustice if he forgot one act of love you showed in his name. One act, one link of the necklace, one dimension of your will exercised before him. He says, I will remember it and I will reward you. He will remember seemingly insignificant acts of devotion, even a cup of cold water. Every single decision we make is remembered by God. Every cup of cold water done in his name is recorded. Beloved, I, I'm not just trying to be cute when I say this, but he pays so well for such little acts of obedience. The exchange rate is very high right now. While we're in the age of faith, little cups of cold water, acts of obedience, movements of our heart are rewarded and God pays such exorbitant rates for small acts of devotion. That's part of the blessedness of believing without seeing is that the exchange rate is real high. In heaven, I'm not sure we get rewarded in the same disproportion we do now for little acts of obedience. 
But right now, everything is turned into eternal currency. Everything we do moving towards him. The exchange rate's really high right now. This is the time to go all the way. The beauty of our love in the sight of God, he says, how fair is, our, is, is your love. He looks at her and he says, oh, this is the fact that crowns us with glory. Jesus looks at you and says, how beautiful is your love. This is just unthinkable. What if we had to win him by the spirit of religion like all the dead religions of the earth? What if we had to come before this very wealthy, indescribably intelligent, powerful monarch and somehow dance in front of him to get his attention and then somehow get him to stamp our passport accepted? What a labor. That's what dead religion is all about. Spirit of, and a dead religion leads to the spirit of despair. Religious spirit always locks our heart down. He says, let me tell you, in your immaturity, your love is stunning and beautiful to me right now. Why? Why is my weak love so beautiful to you? It's because of who I am in my heart. And it's because of the significance of what was accomplished in my redemption. The exchange rate is so high right now. This fact, again, it crowns us in the glory of God. Our love is so, is so beautiful to God. I love this. He goes, Jesus says, how much better than wine is your love? If you remember, she said that sentence first in, in reverse order. She said, Jesus, your love is better than wine. Now Jesus is turning it around. He says, I want to tell you something, young lady. Your love is better than wine. Of all the works of my hands, I would rather possess your heart than all the worlds my Father has given me. Your love is better than anything that my hands have created. Your love is what I want. I mean, it's, it's the mystery of godliness to me. I mean, there's on many dimensions that God seeks worshipers. Why does God want worshipers from humans? Why does Jesus say, Father, I desire that she would be with me? Why does he seek that which is lost? Why does God so love a rebellious world? It's the nature of the one that we serve. Our love is far better than him to wine, and I developed that idea. Jesus' inheritance, Psalm 2.9, is a people that he entirely possesses. He wants to possess the nations. He's not talking about the real estate and the buildings. He's not talking about the gold in the nations when he possesses nations. He's talking about he wants to dominate the affections of the people in those nations. He wants to entirely possess the people of the earth. He wants to possess them. That's what the Father promised him. The affectionate love of the people of the earth. Voluntary lovers. He describes his pleasure over her character. He talks about the scent of her perfumes. That's her thought life. And I'm not going to develop it. You'll have to read it. Oh, beloved, the, the imagery of our thought life being a sweet perfume ascending. Our thoughts of love, our thoughts of desire. When we're crying out, oh God, free me. He goes, oh, it's fragrant perfume when you say free me from what entangles you. He tells us that back in 2.14. He says, your, your face is lovely. Your voice is so sweet. And here he adds that you're thinking. And I describe here and in earlier sessions why perfume is that substance that impacts, but you can never get a handful of it. It's the invisible substance that comes out of the inner life of a plant, yet all are impacted by it. It's the thought life. It speaks of the thought life. And the Lord calls our thought life as we're growing a fragrant perfume that moves him, that's sweet to him. Beloved, if this doesn't want you to fill your mind with the Word of God, I want it to be ever more sweet in the presence of God. He's calling her forth right now. And the thoughts were her thoughts of love and devotion and what it would cost her, but it was worth it giving herself to the Son of God. And Jesus says, those ways of thinking, they move me. They're like perfume to me when I look at you. Pray like that. And I developed those ideas. Her thoughts, then her lips are her words. Then her deeds are her garments. It's thought, word, and deeds. We're going to skip that part just for time's sake. Study the thought, word, and deeds. He looks at her and calls forth and describes how her thoughts, words, and deeds impact his heart. He goes, I feel and see and smell the fragrance that emanates out of you. Again, chapter 4, 1 to 5, he tells her what she looks like. And now he's telling her how she impacts him by how she acts and how she looks. 
He goes, oh, I can feel I'm under the influence of the fragrance of your life. And her garments are like fragrant, the fragrance of Lebanon. Oh, it's, fan- it's fantastic imagery. It's romantic imagery. It's real. Oh, I long that you would get this into your prayer life. Again, it, it, it gives us the power, and I'm not claiming anything about my own life. I'm just saying, so I'm not trying to say that, but it gives us the power for people to do all kinds of bad stuff and all kinds of disappointments, but we have the reward on the inside. These truths romance our hearts to where we carry the reward on the inside. And the disappointments in the labor of the gospel have a total different feel. I'm not there, but that's where I'm aiming. I'm aiming in that direction. But I've touched just a little bit of it to know there's a whole lot more to be had. Get impatient, just fast a little bit and it speeds it up. Okay. Some of you, I can feel your impatience. The bride's deep devotion. He looks at her. Oh, this is fantastic. He describes her as a garden enclosed. It's a spring sealed up. as a fountain sealed. And what I say in essence, he's describing her heart and her emotions. And a king's garden, a, a garden was not a crop. A king didn't like harvest an acre of wheat out of a garden. A garden was something that very few people could afford. A king basically had a garden. It was for pleasure. It wasn't a field that he cultivated, you know, to sell in the marketplace. He would go away. It was a private place where the king would go, and he would just sit and enjoy the fragrance and the beauty. There was some place where he brought his, his, uh, f- his uh, most uh, favorite relationships. He would bring them into the king's garden. It was a very, very special place in, in, the, in the kingdom. You could never go in the king's garden. He looks at her heart, and he says, your heart is a locked garden. Because the, 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 the water sources, the fountains and the springs that are sealed, because in the Old Testament, I have the verses here, in the Old Testament it said that a, a fountain that was not sealed was polluted because all of the, in the agricultural world of that day, the animals would come by and drink from the well and all the manure and the disease, that would be a polluted well. But a king's garden was locked. There was no pollution. There was no defilement. There was no way for disease to get in. He looks at her and he says, the spirit of the world that defiles, your heart is a locked garden before me. Beloved, I challenge you to use this in your devotional life. God looks at your heart and he wants your heart to be a locked garden. He doesn't want our eyes gazing on immorality. He doesn't want us doing a little uh, funny little deals over there economically. He doesn't want us in bitterness. He wants our hearts locked gardens from the spirit of this world. He looks at her and he says, you are a locked garden. That's who you are. And she is just absolutely overwhelmed by that. I challenge you in the Lord to get that language. Oh, God, I want to be a locked garden before you. I want my heart to be a garden that the spirit of the world has no entrance into. I have the verse here, Job 31. Job made a covenant with his eyes. He wouldn't gaze on anything that incited immorality. Job locked the garden of his heart when he made a covenant with his eyes. A covenant with the eyes is an essential dimension in the life of a person pursuing the high places in God. It's absolutely essential that in the filth and all that's being vomited out of hell and the new internet world, that we are people with a covenanted eyes and locked hearts. I'm not talking about rules and regulations. I'm talking about lovesickness. I'm talking about being a man or a woman in whom God finds pleasure in the garden because it's a locked garden. I describe that in, in those pages there. Now he describes the young bride's, her life, the fruitfulness of her life. Her fruitfulness in character, her fruitfulness in ministry. He gives a number of descriptions as the diversity and the fragrance and the sweetness that comes out of her life. That's what's going on here. He looks at her in the most poetic and romantic way. He says, you smell fantastic, you taste fantastic, you look fantastic, and in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, I want to feed what's in your heart to the nations of the world. I want my friends to eat from this garden. What you have in secret is what I want to feed my church with. It's the secret life in God. Sweet, beautiful, fragrant, the garden of her life where nobody's looking. 
That's what she looks like. The diversity of what's, flo- of what's growing. They're plants. They're growing. They're cultivated. There's pruning. There's weeding. It's not an instantaneous, but our hearts are growing in diversity of fragrance and beauty and sweetness. And God wants our hearts to be that which he can feed to others. He talks about three sources now of her ministry. There's the fountain, there's the well, and there's the stream. Three different descriptions of the Holy Spirit ministry that flow out of that lifestyle. There's a fountain, a well, and a stream. Three complete different descriptions of how the Holy Spirit operates in a believer's life, and he speaks that to her. And by the way, Jesus used these very words. He talked about the well. He talked about the fountain. The whole, the, from Genesis to Revelation, the book of Revelation, the, the Gospels, the epistles, they use all this language, by the way. This thing is, could be deeply established in the epistles. Again, these sessions, I'm just advertising this passage of Scripture. There's no way you can get it in a night. It's too much. You, you, it doesn't work that way anyway. You get this like I get it. I don't have it yet. I'm reading it, and I'm rereading it. I'm praying it, and I'm writing it. And I write it in my prayer journal. And I reread it. I repray it. I rewrite it over and over and over. And you just stay with it. I've been doing this hard for 10 years. The Lord called me to Song of Solomon 10 years ago. I'm ready to sign up for another 10-year tour on this thing. I'm ready to go round two for 10 years. See, I don't have it yet, but I'm growing in it. So take this stuff and turn it into your prayer life. Now look what happens here. Chapter, oh, this is fantastic, verse 16. All this beauty and this affirmation in her weakness. She's, she said, I, I'll go to the hill, remember, to the mountain in verse 6. Now in verse 16, a very significant prayer for the increase of the anointing of God, for ministry and the anointing of God to be a lover. The anointing of the first commandment as well as the anointing to fulfill the great commission. That's what's going on. The anointing to love and the anointing to serve are both found here. She looks at the Lord and says, I'm that beautiful to you. You see me as a locked garden. You see all this fragrance in my life. You see my thought life. I still have wrong things. I still have lustful things and angry things and ambitious things in my thought life. And the Lord says, I know you do, but you have the other ones and they're growing and they're growing. And you never used to have any of those. And the Lord, it's not like he can't see the negative, but the positive weighs much stronger with him, even though there's less of it. It weighs so much. The exchange rate is so high. She prays, okay, now this is the courage. This is the prayer. This is, this so far exceeds anything she's ever prayed up to now. She goes, okay, God, if, if this is how it works, if this is how it feels to be in your safe embrace. Again, her life, her natural circumstances aren't safe. I mean, the martyrs get killed. That's what martyrdom is. But her heart is safe. Wherever God leads her, her heart will be fascinated and her heart will expand in the love of God. And it will last, and the rewards of it will last forever and forever. That's what I mean by safety. The essence of her being cannot be destroyed. All her, her outer man may be beat down, but her inner man cannot be triumphed over. She says, okay, Jesus, awake north winds. Come south winds. Blow upon my garden that its spices may flow out. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. The, north, the first prayer for the north winds. The north winds speak of the cold winds of difficulty. She has the courage. She says, I'm not afraid of the high mountains anymore. I'm not afraid of the lions and the lepers. Lord, in your sovereignty, send the north winds. I'm not afraid of the north winds. In the grace of God, I'm not afraid of the north winds. What a courageous prayer. She says also, Lord, send the south winds. Those are the warm, refreshing winds of the south. She says, I want both. And I have written in one of the paragraphs here that she says, I trust you for the combination, the right mixture in whatever season. And the Lord himself only knows what is the right combination of the north and the south winds in your heart right now. One season, the south winds are blowing stronger. The next season, the north winds are blowing stronger. The next season, the, 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 uh, the mix is completely different because the Lord knows what you need in this hour. And what happens is God's people close their spirit in fear, retreat and turn away from him. And they say, I'm not going any further with you right now. I'm staying right here. And the Lord says, oh, I wish you would see the beauty that you have before me and the way I love you. I would that you would open your spirit and ask me for the north winds. You would trust me. She's not saying make it difficult. That's not what she's saying. She's saying, Lord, I'm not afraid in your embrace. 
I'm not closing my spirit to you if the gospel brings me to prison. If it brings me to prison, to prison I go. I don't hope I go to prison. I trust you with wherever you go. I don't close my spirit in the way you would lead me. North and south winds. And look at, at the motive. Why? Why does she want the winds to blow? The winds of blessing as well as the winds of difficulty. Paul the apostle knew both winds at different combinations, different seasons. She says, I want the fragrance of God to flow out of my being. That's what I want. I want the fragrance of Christ Jesus to emanate. I want what you smell like to be all over me. I want to look like you and smell like you. What a statement. She goes, I want my fragrances, my spices to flow. And then she says a very, very significant statement here. Let my beloved come. No, at first she says, blow upon my garden. Now she says, let my beloved come to his garden. Right here, the, the middle verse of the Song of Solomon. Right dead in the middle. After four chapters, there's four to go. The last verse of the fourth chapter, this is where it all changes. It was her garden, the first four chapters. From now on, in one verse it changes, it is now his garden. Remember in the early parts of this course, her inheritance is what preoccupied her in the first four chapters. Her inheritance in Christ, but the second pillar of the gospel is Jesus' inheritance in her. And now what she is belonging to him is now dominating her thinking. For four chapters, and this is very valid and very essential, we are absolutely overwhelmed and preoccupied with what we get. In time and eternity, and it's supposed to be that way. But there's a place where we say, let the north and the south wind blow my garden is now preoccupied with you and your purpose. I am now your garden. And the thing completely changes. The very tenor of the book changes the last four chapters. Very, very different than the first four. And to compare the two are staggering in their difference. He is now calling her forth into his interest instead of telling her how beautiful she is every step of the way. He continues the testimony of her beauty, but it, on the front end, he's wooing her and convincing her. She says, I want my life to produce pleasant fruits. I want to be what you feast on, Jesus. Feast on me, my devotion and my life. If I am what you long for, I am yours. In this age, now we know in the age to come we are, but beloved, there's nothing more powerful than a believer in this age who, who has to operate by faith, abandoned to the beautiful God without ever fully being able to see him. That moves his heart so deeply. And then Jesus, he says, okay. He takes possession. I will come to my garden. He says, now it's, I'm taking over now. It is now my garden. I come to it. And I will gather nine things. He, de he declares his ownership over nine things. He goes, I will gather all the fruit of what I've worked in you. Oh, when Jesus comes to your life and calls it his garden by your invitation. You know, you belong to him no matter what in the eternal sense. But when you as a voluntary lover say, you are mine, there's no more hassle. You don't have to wrestle with me. I'm yours. My thoughts, my words, my money, my time, my agendas, my reputation, I'm yours. North, south, when just let spice increase. Let fruit be sweet coming out of my life. We'll end with this. Jesus then looks to the rest of the church and says... Oh, my friends, eat and drink deeply from her life. Paul the Apostle said in 2 Corinthians 4, 10 to 12, he said, I endure all these hardships that you would get the benefit. Jesus said it in John 17. He goes, I set myself apart so that you get the benefit. Jesus is pointing at her saying, I'm going to so lead her now to where the fragrance will come and it will increase the church she's lost all of her rights to herself now now he's inviting the body of christ to drink deep of what god does in her she is no longer an echo she is now a voice she's not just one that memorized a message she's one that has lived in it in the secret place where no one's looking she is now a voice and not an echo and that voice will change the lives of many many people amen let's stand I'm going to have our YWAM friends come up here. We're going to make you our guest tonight. We're going to gather around you and give you the best we have. It's not that much, but we're going to give it to you. I want you guys to just line up and just have a couple feet in between each one of you. Enough to try and get five, six people around each one of you. Just spread out, four or five feet between each one of you.
Yeah, just, just, just keep going all the way down. <clears throat> These are leaders over many, many people, and they're on the front lines. They've paid a price. Many of their lives they have a dedication that I'm encouraged by. I see their dedication. I don't know each individual life, but I know the spirit that's on the YWAM leadership. They want to go hard. Yes, they're weak, broken people like us, but they said yes in their spirit. Many of them have said, yes, Lord, I want to go to the mountain. I'll go. I don't understand everything, but I want to go. Go ahead, you. We're going to worship for just a moment. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.